today. Welcome. I'm grateful. And isn't it beautiful today? That sun is shining again, isn't it? And it's so good. Um, today, if you read your digital bulletin, you know that today is communion. We are observing communion together. And when you came through the doors, you received a communion cup. If you don't have one, please, during the next few songs, feel free to sneak back there and make sure that you have one. I've missed communion. Have you? I don't know if you've thought about it. Um, over throughout COVID, we have still observed communion um, a number of times, but it wasn't quite as often as what we have in the past. And and I really have honestly, I've missed it. Um, now, communion can become very ritualistic. You know what I mean by that? Like habitual, we just do the same thing over and over again. We just know that, well, this is what we do when we're supposed to do it. 
And we almost don't even have to engage our minds with it because we're just so used to it. I don't want that. And God doesn't want that. That, that is empty when we come that way to him. But I, I want us just to think and remind ourselves about why we do this. This is not for ritual. This is for relationship. We do this because of relationship. We do this because we have a relationship with God our Father, which comes to us through his son, Jesus. And we remember that. And so we actually remind ourselves of what Christ accomplished on the cross for us. Because I am sinful and because you are sinful. Jesus came and paid the penalty for that sin so that you and I could have a relationship with him. And that is so beautiful. And so today, in a little bit, we are going to reflect on that. We are going to remember that. And I invite you as the next few songs are, as, as we pray, as we sing praise to God, I just invite you to reflect on this, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made on your behalf. And I also invite you to just kind of take your mind and remember when you first placed your faith in Christ. So I ask you, have you placed your faith in Christ? Communion is for the body of believers. If you haven't placed your faith in Christ, then maybe just respectfully observe. Or better yet, choose to follow Jesus right now. Place your faith in Jesus right now. Yes, Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm sinful. And I come and I acknowledge that. Come into my life. I'm going to read a passage from Isaiah, just a few verses, likely familiar to you, but I just, I want to remind you that these are, these words are spoken of Jesus. They're prophetic words. This is before the cross, but when we look at this, we understand that this was the Messiah. This was Jesus. So hear these words. He, Jesus, was despised and rejected by mankind. That's you and me. A man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He, Jesus, the Messiah, was despised, and we held him in low esteem. This is what humanity did with the Messiah. Surely he, Jesus, the Messiah, took up our pain and bore our suffering Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he, Jesus, the Messiah, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. Continue to worship. Reflect and remember the sacrifice that Jesus, our Messiah, made for us.
the 
know that to be true with all our heart, that your wounds did pay our ransom. God, your love is so deep and just beyond all measure. God, how could we fathom? How can we benefit from your reward? God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you would include us in that reward and in that eternity in heaven to spend with you. Um, in, the, in these things, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you are seated, I invite you just to take the bread that you have in your communion cup. Bread is symbolic, isn't it? It's, it's meant to be symbolic. Scripture tells us that right before Jesus was betrayed, he met with his disciples for what was called the Passover meal. And he took, took the bread and he broke the bread. But there was, there was new meaning, there was new depth of meaning that was brought to this, this meal. And he just reminded People, he said, be, before he went there, he said, I am the bread of life. And so it's this reminder that his body would be broken for us. And he broke the bread and he said, take this in remembrance of me. And then the apostle Paul later said, reflecting back on that time, said, we are to do this. We are to do this in remembrance of Christ. So I invite you to take the bread right now and reflect and remember as we've already been doing. Be thankful for Christ's body broken for you. Take the bread right now. I invite you to also take the cup because scripture goes on and it tells us that around the same table, Jesus took the cup. My cup is having a hard time coming undone. Are you having the same problem? Church family, I love you so much because throughout COVID, we changed how we do communion, right? No one once has ever told me I don't like this, but I know that no one likes this because <laughs> I don't like it. I, I get tired of these little cups here, but I just think it's amazing to be part of a church family where I'm serious. Not one person has come up to me and complained. When are we going to have the old cups? They're coming back. They're coming back eventually, but we're faithful stewards to, to do this. Did you get yours off? I finally got mine off. <laughs> I'm reminded again that Jesus, around the same table, he took the wine. This is grape juice here. It's about six months old, so maybe we're getting closer to being fermented. <laughs> and he took it and he said, this is also, and he didn't say, he didn't use the word symbolic, but we know it's symbolic. This is my blood. Was his blood? No, he was right there with them. And then the apostle Paul draws attention to this table and what Jesus was doing. This is my blood poured out for you. Why? Because Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Do we realize that? Without the shedding of blood, we have no forgiveness. Jesus, his blood was shed for us. Why? So that we could have forgiveness. And so in this, we find forgiveness, not in a cup. This again is symbolic. This cup reminds us of the blood of Jesus poured out so that you and I might have life with God. So be grateful. Be grateful for the blood of Jesus poured out for you. Take the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the reminders that you have given us, this is not something that the church instituted. Nope, this comes from you. I thank you for that. Thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you that we 
can have life with you. We praise you for new life that is found in you, for the forgiveness of sins. Father, may there be joy that comes to us because our sins are forgiven. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. information on you or your family has changed since the church directory has come out, please go to the back and fill out a correction form and we'll an update form and we'll get that updated. Today's the last day to do that. Thanksgiving meal. We're going to have a delightful Thanksgiving meal together, a homemade turkey and mashed potatoes, real mashed potatoes. And uh, the church will supply those and the, the beverages. We just, we're just asking you to bring two things. If you could bring your family's favorite Thanksgiving side dish, uh, stuffing, rolls, salad, dessert, whatever goes good 
that your family enjoys with a Thanksgiving meal, bring that along and then bring a friend or, or a neighbor. Uh, invite your neighbors to come and join us, especially if you live in the area. And uh, on that note, Pastor Nathan and I will be meeting here next Wednesday at 11 a.m., and we're going to walk around the neighborhood and talk to our neighbors and invite, the, invite our neighbors to come and join us for a nice meal. And if you have a block of time open at that time on Wednesday morning, come on and join us. And, and uh, we'll invite some of the, the neighbors to come and share a Thanksgiving meal with us. That's next Sunday, the 21st. Uh, is when the meal is going to be right after the, uh, our worship time together. If you're interested in helping to decorate the church for Christmas, uh, we're going to be doing that at 7 o'clock, November 23rd. That's this Tuesday. We'll have some, some, uh, uh, some treats here, and we'll get together and make the place look bright and festive. And that's a, a fun time, so come on out and join us Tuesday, 7 o'clock. And thank you for all of you who have been participating in uh, Operation Christmas Child. You have one more week if you haven't done your shopping yet and put a box together. One more week to, uh, to do that and bring the boxes here next week. That'll be our last day. And if you're new here, there's a card in front of you, a connection card. Grab that card and fill it out and, and uh, give us information about you so we can uh, know you're here and reach out and see if there's any way we can help, anything we could do, get to know you a little better. Bring it to the back over by the, the TV monitor and uh, there'll be a, a nice gift for you. And now the mission's... Uh, the missions care team is going to come up and make an announcement. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas everywhere you go. <laughs> what are you guys again. doing? We haven't even celebrated Thanksgiving yet. But if we don't get our Christmas cards and Christmas gifts ready for the missionaries, they're not going to be there in time for Christmas. That's, so that's start getting in your festive mood. So today is the first day to be able to give to... <laughs> Today is our first day to be able to give finances to be able to support our missionaries. We're giving them a nice Christmas gift. We have seven missionary units working throughout the world, as well as multiple that are here helping in our own hometown. So today is the first week to be able to give financially, as well as the next three weeks up until December 5th. And yeah. Oh, I have two mics. Okay. <laughs> but I... Uh, we also want to give the little kids a chance to be able to encourage the missionaries. To encourage the missionaries. So, if your little kids want to draw a picture or write a little note that we can add to the Christmas cards and add with the Christmas gift for the missionaries, that would be great. And we will. They can bring it. To, you guys can bring it to me or Olivia or Lily or give it to Nathan, and we'll get those out to the missionaries. And besides sending them money, we're going to also send them homemade cards. So next week, me, Ava, Lily, and Cayman will, their parents are doing the turkeys. So we'll see. But we'll have a table at the gym with the Thanksgiving meal. You can come in, sign a card, write an encouraging note, and you can give money then or in the offering. I think that, oops, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> um, I should know. It's okay. But you can give money next week, and you can sign a card next week and bring the coloring kids, coloring sheets to kids. So yeah. Yeah, and in this time, if you want to just remember to keep our missionaries in your prayers, just so, just be able to encourage them so we can tell them all about how much our church family loves them, that would be great. Thank you. Good job. All right, thank you. Appreciate that announcement there. 
Um, I want to let you know that there are, we are obviously, as, as was shared, we're reaching out to our missionaries. We want to let them know how much we care about them and how much we love them. And there's also going to be some opportunity to reach out to the neighborhood right here um, at Christmas time. So I just want you to be aware of that. Um, just have it on your radar. Um, we'll be sharing more about that um, as, as we get closer to Christmas, okay? So um, I also would like to let you know, Arliss, thank you so much for playing. I appreciate you doing that. Arliss has carpal tunnel surgery on Wednesday. And so would you please be praying that that all goes well. Um, we are trusting that it will, and we look forward to when you are able to play again. All right. So, and then um, please continue to pray for Mike, um, both Mike and Dolly. Mike is, um, if you did not hear, he, he fell last week making a delivery and um, broke his pelvis and is in, uh, was taken to the hospital and then was transported to a rehab place here in Salem. Uh, we praise the Lord that he is actually at a rehab place in Salem. At first it was all full, and then um, God provided a place. Uh, but as you can imagine, he is in pain, and it's, it's difficult. They're, they're managing the pain, um, but uh, just, just be praying for him. So, Mike, you might be listening online, and just know that your church family misses you. We love you very much. And um, we continue to pray. All right, I invite you to join me in prayer right now. And we are going to conclude this week on this series called Living in Babylon. It's where we've been the last couple months, and we're going to conclude here today. So, Lord God, we come to you. Um, we, we just, you've already, we've been looking to you, but we just acknowledge that we need you even as we are looking at Scripture. Um, we, we want you to teach us. And God, I, I recognize that I am just a human being who is here to deliver your word, so I need your spirit empowerment. And if this is to make sense to us, I need your spirit conviction in my life and in the life of my church family. So God, you are the one that does the work, not me. And um, I just, I simply ask that you would allow this time together to be speaking to us as, as you know it needs to. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Years ago, a young family raised with faith in the Lord noticed that their country was quickly turning from truth and instead choosing to follow their own pleasures. Sound a little bit familiar? This caused them to choose, they had to choose whether or not they would compromise. Are we going to go along with the culture or are we going to stand strong in our culture? They had to choose. Would they stand strong with their convictions? When the family's oldest son was 15, give or take some, an evil nation swept through, taking hostage a number of people who served, and they put them to work in the evil nation's palace, working for the king. One of those taken was this family's 15-year-old son. Ripped away from family, he was led miles away and would never again return. Never again return. This 15-year-old young man was trained by this evil nation. It was simply indoctrination. We're going to indoctrinate you with what you must believe. What we say is right. You've been taught this? No, 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 no. This is what truth is. Yet this 15-year-old befriended three others his age who surprisingly shared his conviction. And even more surprisingly, they too were unwilling to compromise their conviction. Together, these four young men stood strong. They went against the cultural norm and remained faithful in faith to the Lord, the faith that they were taught as children. They remained faithful, not just in year 15, 16, and 17, when they were 15, 16, and 17 years old. They remained faithful for their lifetime. They stood strong. 
And because they stood strong, hear this, kings, yes, kings, were made aware of the one true God. And kings chose to worship the one true God. And it wasn't just kings who were made aware of the one true God. Many people were made aware of the one true God. This is the story of Daniel. This is where we've been the last two months. This is Daniel. This morning, I want to simply draw your attention to five things. I don't usually do bullets like this, five things. But yes, five things that I believe we can really draw away and take home to Salem, Oregon, to the Willamette Valley, wherever our residence is, right here in Oregon. Five things that we can just kind of say, okay, I need this. These are principles I can learn. Because I've mentioned a number of times in this series, we are not Babylon. We do not have it as bad as Babylon did. We do not have it nearly as bad as Daniel and his three buddies had it. But we are living in a culture where we are recognizing more and more, and it sometimes feels like by the day, I am the alien. I am the outcast. I don't fit here anymore. I don't think like my culture does. Good job. We were never supposed to be. Biblically speaking, what scripture tells us, you are foreigners and aliens. That's who you are. Did you know that? You probably didn't wake up this morning and say that to yourself, looked at yourself in the mirror and said, hey, you're a foreigner, you're an alien. But scripture will tell you that. We are just passing through. This is not our home. Babylon is not my home, it's not your home. Salem, Oregon, my address is West Salem, yes. My spiritual address is heaven. That's where my citizenship lies. That's where your citizenship lies. Don't get so comfortable here that you forget that. We forget that, don't we? Yes, thank you for that, amen, because we forget that. We forget, we get really comfortable and we start to think, this is my home, I like this place. We need this reminder. And as hard as it's been the last few years, I think the shakeup is actually doing something good to the church. It's saying, wake up church, it's not your home. You are made for something more. Your citizenship is in heaven. You don't live for Salem. You don't live for Oregon. You don't live for the USA. No, you live with your eyes on Jesus. And you remember that your home is eternally in heaven. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep moving ahead. And don't let all this other stuff distract you. Because it does distract us. It wants to distract us. With this in mind, five things I give to you this morning. And are there more? Absolutely. Because Daniel is packed. As you have seen the last eight previous Sundays. Daniel is packed. There is so much good here. But here's five things that I want to highlight for you this morning. And you're going to see them on the screen. The very first is this. The Lord permitted pain and provided wisdom at the same time. The Lord permitted pain and the Lord also provided wisdom at the same time. Do we have these slides up there? Awesome. Thank you. The Lord permitted pain and the Lord provided wisdom at the same time. I want you to recognize this really quickly. Take your Bible. Turn to, you guessed it, Daniel. Turn to Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. We've already read these verses before, but I'm going to read them again. Just verses 1 and 2. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah... Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Ouch! And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Whose hand? Nebuchadnezzar's hand. 
along with some of the articles of the temple of God. Did you hear that? Who permitted this? God did. Does that bother you? It's hard to hear, isn't it? God permitted this. I want you to hear that. We don't like to think about this. The Lord permitted this. The Lord permitted this pain. Now, there is, there's some backstory here, isn't there? There's certainly some backstory here. God warned them. If you are not going to be faithful, if you reject me, you just need to understand that there are consequences coming for that rejection. It's not going to be pretty. Nations who you despise will come and take you away. That's exactly what happened. God warned them. God warned them centuries earlier, said, you need to be faithful. Okay, so I, I understand that's at play here. But I also want you to hear this. Scripture says, Daniel says, God delivered King Jehoiakim into the hands of an evil tyrant. Jehoiakim wasn't all that great either. But God delivered Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Hear that. Let it sit with you a little bit. God did this. I think from a human perspective, Nebuchadnezzar, who was full of himself, thought, I did that. I did that. I'm powerful. I'm mighty. That's the whole reason why I conquered Jerusalem. Because my army is so great, because I am so great. No, it's not. Perspective. Nebuchadnezzar, no, it's not. There is one who reigns over you who is much greater than you. Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of his life, realized that. His power was suddenly taken from him. The one who thought he was mighty, it was taken. It was taken from him. In our society, we can get discouraged today. God, it seems as though evil just triumphs. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I think that we need to remind ourselves of who really holds power. Who really holds control? Nebuchadnezzar believed that he had the power until he was humbled for seven years. All of a sudden, his eyes were opened. I am not as great as I think I am. God permitted the pain. And I'm just here to remind you that God permits pain in our life. God is not the author of evil. He does not say, oh, I want this sin to be so. No, it doesn't work that way. But God also provides freedom to choose. And in that choice, we often choose poorly and it has a, it has a terrible impact on other people. And we see that. We see that lived out in Daniel. God provided, or God, God permitted the pain. But I also want you not to miss this. God also provided the wisdom. Because at the same time, we read in verse 17, and if you're there, you can just look at it. And if not, just here. It just says this, chapter 1, verse 17 of Daniel, to these four men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. The, the word could also be translated wisdom. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Notice that Daniel could understand visions and dreams. His friends could not. Daniel had something even more spectacular, in a sense, than what his friends, but his friends had wisdom and knowledge. God gave this. So in this culture and in this pain, God never forsook them. And God was giving them wisdom in this culture to know how to navigate. You and I, you and I need wisdom today. 
You and I need wisdom to know how to engage our culture, when we draw the line, where we draw the line. We are being pushed more and more. There is a stronger agenda which goes very much opposed to Scripture. We know that. I'm not telling you anything new. We need the wisdom of God. We know the end of the story. God has already told us what is yet to happen. Things are going to crumble. It's going to get bad. Is it going to happen in our lifetime? I don't know. Is it going to get worse? Yes. I don't know how that's going to play out. I cannot say. But I am just here to remind you that God is still in control. He has not lost control. And I think if I could give a message to an evil tyrant, I would say, please understand that you think you have power and you don't. God has power. Recognize his power. But you and I are oftentimes the recipient of politicians who, who make all kinds of statements or, or say, this is how it's going to be. And we are the recipient. And we just must live with it. In that, I want to remind you that God is the one who permits that. And it is going to get worse. I'm not trying to be doom and gloom, but I am here to be speaking truth. It is going to get worse. And yet in that, God is going to give you wisdom. God is going to give you his wisdom. He is going to let you know, how do I respond in these moments? And so God is the one who permits pain. He's not the author of pain, but he recognizes that this is going to happen because people are free to choose. And yet God is also going to provide wisdom at the same time. Number two, second thing that we can take away from Daniel. We need godly relationships to help us stand strong. We need godly relationships to help us stand strong. Um, when we're able to get to that second slide, we'll do it. But if not, you can at least just hear my voice here. We need godly relationships to help us stand strong. Can you imagine how this would have played out differently if Daniel had not had Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, a.k.a. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? If, if, if they... If he had not had these, these guys with him, can you imagine how this would have played out differently? Now, I'm not suggesting that Daniel would have caved. I don't know what the story would have been. I'm just grateful that, that Daniel, at such, an, uh, at such a young age, found three young men who helped keep him accountable, who helped encourage him, who, when he was in, you know, feeling the pressure, he went to them and said, can we pray? Can we pray together? And they would pray together. Like, those are the things that we have recorded. You and I need others with us who can encourage us and help us remain strong and faithful to the Lord. So I ask you this morning, who is your Hananiah? Who is your Mishael and who is your Azariah? Who do you have walking with you? Are we to be a light to the neighborhood and to the world? Absolutely. And that, that means that we must place ourselves in dark places. But how foolish, how foolish we are when we think that we can take on the darkness by ourselves. You and I need people surrounding us who can encourage us. I don't care your age bracket. Teenagers up to elderly. We all need people surrounding us who can help us stand strong. Why? Because I am not as great as I think I am. That is just a tactic of the enemy. The enemy wants to feed that to Nate's mind. You are greater than what you think. You can stand strong. No, I can't. 
I need people surrounding me, praying for me. I need encouragement. That's why we have church. God did this intentionally. We need this gathering. Because after six days, we get worn down. We need each other. We need the gift of encouragement. So who is in your life that can help encourage you? Again, I don't care if you are public, private, or homeschooled. I don't care if you work for the state or for the church. And I said it once, I'll say it twice. I don't care if you're 15 or 82. We live in a culture, have you recognized, that is wearing off on us. It has an impact. It wears us down. We are far more impacted by our culture than what we realize. The church today is more secular than what we are willing to admit. We are more driven by politicians than scripture. We are more driven by cultural norms than by the Bible. We like to let this, and we like to even, we, we even convince ourselves that we're not because we know that's foolish. And yet just look at how the church has shifted over the last 20 years. Why does the church believe certain things today that we would have rejected 20 or 30 years ago? I'll tell you why. Culture is driving the church. May it never be. And I know that we have, no, we, we have no control over the church at large, but Kingwood Bible Church, may that not be our story. May we not be driven by culture. May we be driven by the truth of God's word. And may we have people in our life who are able to just sharpen us as iron sharpens iron. May you and I sharpen each other because we need each other. A third slide here um, is this. Faith is neither private nor obnoxious. Did you catch those? But appropriately on display. What do I mean by that? Faith is neither private. Was the faith of Daniel or his three buddies, was it private? No. It was not private. If it was private, they probably would not have gotten themselves into the trouble that they got themselves into. But here, this church, their faith was also not obnoxious. They were not just like, I'm going to be obnoxious. I'm going to be the guy on the street corner telling you that you better turn or burn. You know, like it, they, he, they were not like that. I don't read that. I think that they had a faithful presence in Babylon. But I'm also here to remind you that their faith was public. Not obnoxiously public, but they were willing to take a stand. So just think about this. When the four young men, about age 15, resisted eating the king's food, their faith took a stand. Why did they do that? It was because of their faith. We will not defile ourselves. Their faith went public. When Daniel stood before Nebuchadnezzar to interpret a dream, what did he say? He credited God as the only one who could ever help him interpret the dream. He said, King, I cannot interpret the dream, but there is a God who can. He is the only one who can. Faith was public. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were threatened with the furnace, they responded, our God is able to save us, and our God will. But you must hear this, King, even if our God does not, we will not bow down. We're not going to do it. We're not going to bow down to your image. Their faith was public. They went public with their faith. They weren't just hiding what they believed. They took a stand. When Daniel stood before King Belshazzar, he claimed, 
The Lord is the one who enabled him to understand the interpretation of the dream. When Daniel was thrown into a den of lions, King Darius said, May your God, whom you serve, how often? Continually. May your God, whom you serve continually, meaning I have already seen this. I've taken note. I know who you are and I know who you, where you stand. Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, fight for you. May he rescue you. King Darius knew exactly where he stood. Daniel. Daniel and these three guys made their faith known. Now, keep in mind that these events took place over how many years? Seventy. Seventy years. You and I can read scripture and we can think, oh my goodness, Daniel was like this maniac, like supernatural maniac. Like he just walked around. It was just incredible. He had some incredible moments in his lifetime. And there is a lot, I believe, of just faithful presence, just faithfully living out his relationship with Yahweh, the one true God. We have in Daniel noted these highlights, but there were many days where Daniel was probably almost backseat. I mean, he had some high positions, but we don't have anything recorded. Why? Because I really believe that he was just being faithful to the God whom he loves, whom he loved and served. And so it didn't make the chapter, but there were these moments where we say, oh my goodness, that's incredible. Absolutely incredible. I think that Daniel and his friends were excellent examples of people who knew when when to go public with their faith, when to say, I cannot go here. I cannot do that. If you're going to throw me into the den with lions, so be it. If you're going to put me in the furnace, so be it. They knew when to go public. The next slide here, number four, if you're taking notes. Number four, followers of the one true God seek the peace of their city. Followers of the one true God seek the peace of their city. Remember when we started this series? I took you to Jeremiah chapter 29. And I did that because Jeremiah the prophet was prophesying words for those Jewish people who would be taken captive into Babylon. And, and Jeremiah said, when you are taken captive... Seek the peace of the city that you are taken captive by. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city that takes you captive. Remember, we talked about that. What strange words, what hard words to hear. But we have 70 years indicating that these four young men did this very thing. They were seeking the peace of Babylon. A culture which was polytheistic means that they believed in many gods. They didn't care about the one true God. And yet they were seeking the peace of that city. They were seeking the prosperity of Babylon. So just, just stop and just consider this. The practical peace is, is, is obvious, right? Are you seeking the peace of Salem? Salem. Shalom peace. We are supposed to be a city of peace. As a, by definition, that's what we're supposed to be. Are, are you, as a follower of Jesus, seeking the peace of Salem? Are you seeking the peace of Albany, of Brooks, of Independence, of Dallas, um, of Kaiser? You know, I'm, I'm like thinking about like where, where we are just all over, you know, West Salem, South Salem, Northeast Salem, we're all over. Are, are you seeking the peace of the place that God has planted you right now? Are you seeking the prosperity of that place? 
We talked about this. We can be, as Christians, we can be complainers, can't we? Let's, it's hard. There are times where I complain too. But, but how are we, what are we doing? Silverton, Silverton, I just thought, even in Silverton, you know, my wife is from Silverton, but we have a family from Silverton. Like we are all over. How are we seeking the peace and the prosperity of the place in which we are planted? What, what are you doing to seek the peace? If all we do is gripe and complain, my goodness, we are doing anything but seeking the peace of the city. Does that mean that we are supposed to just always be compliant people who never say uh, no? Of course not. Of course not. But, but what are we doing to engage with our culture? What are we doing to engage with those near us? What are we doing to engage with a community to say, hey, Kingwood Bible Church is a place that actually cares for the betterment of our neighborhood. Kingwood Bible Church actually cares about the betterment of our community. How do they know that? What makes them know that? Or are we just viewed as, well, those are people who just care about themselves and they just care about their rights and all of the blah, 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 blah. You've heard it all, right? Well, what are we doing to, to seek the peace of the place in which you and I are planted? Daniel and his buddies did an excellent job at seeking the peace with a culture that they completely disagreed with. Completely disagreed with. I love this example of Daniel. Final number five here. Engage our culture or our, engage our cultural context with a missional mindset. Engage our cultural context with missional mindset. Okay, what do I, what do I mean by that? If, if you and I went to serve as missionaries next week in Paris, France, you with me? Let's go to Paris, France. We're going to serve as missionaries. Our perspective is going to be very different in going there, isn't it? Why do I say that? Because in, Paris, in, in France as a whole, 95% of the people in France believe that the church has absolutely no, they, they have no need for the church. 95%, okay? 19 out of 20 people in France believe that there is no place for the church. Why do I say that? because no one goes to church in France, okay? The 5% that do, they're Catholic, mostly Catholic, and, and they are the Christers, the Christmas and Easter Christians, right? Okay, they, they would be like, well, I'll go to mass occasionally. It is, it is, they go because like, I just, I have to. Like, I was born into this. But there is, there is, there is very little relationship, like true relationship with, with God. Okay. If you and I went there, we would have that mindset and we would say, my goodness, this is the culture that we're going to. We don't get extremely bothered by that because it's the reality. You and I need a shift in our perspective with our culture. You and I need to learn a lot from our missionaries. I have figured for at least 15 years, I remember thinking this as a youth pastor, we have so much to learn from our missionaries because our missionaries go to a culture and they try to learn that culture. They don't agree with the culture, but they want to learn the culture. We are here because this is our culture. And as Christians, we oftentimes just fight it and say, let's just set the clock back. I just want it to be like it used to be. I want it to be like it used to be too, trust me. I thoroughly want it to be like it used to be. Reality check, it's not going to be. Reality check says, learn from my missionary brothers and sisters. Study my culture. How can I be more missional in my own culture? How, how might a missionary if Paul and Virginia Tanner came here and served in Salem, Oregon, what would they do? It's a question worth asking. 
because they already have the mindset, I'm going to reach my culture. Of course they're lost. In Polk County, 24.3% of people go to church. They claim themselves as religious. I say Polk County because we are Polk County, of course, you know, West Salem. Sorry, Marion County, just over the bridge, but, um, and it's a little bit higher in Marion County, actually. Now, religious, by culture's definition, does not mean biblical, and it does not mean scriptural, and it does not mean born again. Religious means you claim a faith. You could be Mormon, you could be Muslim, you, you could be Baptist, you could be anything, you know? That's, did, did, you, did you hear me? That means that at least 75.7% .7 of people in Polk County say, church is irrelevant, I don't need the church, I will not go to the church. And even of the quarter of us who say, I want the church, guess what? There's a lot that we would say, well, mission field is pretty, there's a big mission field there because we definitely look at Jesus differently. Did you hear that? What I'm saying is we got a mission field right here. Like you go this afternoon and talk to three other people. Guess what? Chances are they do not believe anywhere remotely close to how you believe. Why? Because you are the quarter <laughs> and they are the three quarter. One out of four people are going to view everything very differently. And even out of those people who are religious, again, we have a lot of differences. So much as I would say, well, many of them are not born again because they do not believe in Jesus as Jesus should be believed in. Engage our cultural context with the missional mindset. I think that we see that from Daniel. If you're still in Daniel, turn to chapter, chapter 12. It's the close of, of uh, Daniel. These final words might seem a little bit peculiar here, but I, I pass these on. Daniel chapter 12, verses 5 through 10. Now, in these verses, Daniel is, um, he, has, he has given a lot of prophetic word, a lot of this is going to happen yet. And a lot of what he said, and it's, we have not looked at these chapters, a lot of what he says is something that is still yet to happen. It is still coming yet in our time. We have not seen this, okay? But then Daniel closes with these words, Verse 5, then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? How long before these things that you have prophesied are going to be fulfilled? The man, verse 7, clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, times and half a time, that's three and a half years, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. Verse 8, I heard but I did not understand. And you might even be thinking, I resonate with that a little bit right now. Nate, where are you even going with this? Why are we reading these times, times and a half? You know, okay, hear this though. What will be the outcome of, what, what will the outcome of this be? What, what, what is gonna be the outcome of all of this? Like, in light of all that has been prophesied, and again, we have not looked at this, but these future events, what, what's the outcome of all of this going to be? And, and perhaps you can understand that feeling, like just looking into 2022, God, oh, I've just really wondered what, what life in America will even be like in three months. Like, I, I'm just curious what life will be like next year. I'm just curious what it will be like in two years. And I, I just really like this response. Verse 9, he replied, Go your way, Daniel. Go your way, Daniel, because 
The words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand. But those who are wise, they will understand. These, these words here are probably not what Daniel wanted to hear. Like, explain this. I, I have more I want to know. I, I want to know about future events. I'd like to know when this is all going to happen. I want to know how it's going to play out. Daniel, go your way. Go your way. Can I, can I tell you the same thing? Nathan, go your way. You, church family, go your way. In a sense, almost don't get so tied up with, I don't know what's going to happen next year. I don't know how this is all going to play out. There's so much chaos. I, I don't like living in Babylon. I don't know what to do with this. Go your way. Would you go your way? What way? The right way? You go your way. You know what's right. You live in the truth. You do this. And, and I love these words that were given to Daniel. Like, in this time, some people are going to be purified. And some people are going to be refined. Do you recognize that, church? This next year, regardless of what we encounter, we have an opportunity to be refined. We have an opportunity to be renewed, to be purified. God is not giving up. And Daniel was given this too. And the wicked, guess what? They're going to continue to be wicked. That's what he was told. The wicked will just continue being wicked. But you, Daniel, you go your way. You keep living in the truth. You know how to live in the truth. And Daniel was given these words at the end of his life. He had already been faithful, but you continue to go your way. Church family, I invite us just to continue to go our way, our way in the Lord, to remain faithful to him. Yes, the... You know, the future doesn't always look so promising. But may we be faithful. May we be faithful to the Lord as we live in our Babylon. May we remain faithful to the Lord. Lord God, we, we pray that, that those very words for us that we would be faithful. I pray that we are able to take principles or truth from this, this book that can encourage us and speak to our hearts this morning. And Father, about you know, these things that, that, that concern us, these things that bother us, it's hard to live in a Babylon-type place. God, may, may we recognize, first off, that there are still people right here in our area, in our communities, that are going to be refined. People whose eyes are going to be open to the truth of your son, Jesus. And we also recognize that the wicked are going to continue. That's going to continue as well. God, you are the one that provides, you, you, you permit, you permit this, you permit the pain, it's hard for us. God, in that you also provide the wisdom for us to know how to navigate our culture. So God, I pray that you would do that. Lord, may we be faithful to you as we go our way, as we continue to live the life that you have called us to. We love you and we give you praise this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray.
and sisters, stand firm. Are you willing to stand firm? Are you willing to stand firm? Brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because you and I both know that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. Blessings to each and every one of you. You are dismissed. There's cookies and coffee in the activity center. Blessings to you. It was so good having you join us online for church today. I trust that God was able to speak to you and encourage you in ways that only he can. Many of you I will probably never meet, but for those of you who are local, I invite you to connect with me in some way. Kingwood Bible Church has room for you.